Last Sunday, our pastor, if you'll remember, he spoke to us about fishing. Now, Charlie, he's always showing you know his pictures, his proof of what he's been doing and all. But that topic that he spoke about on fishing, that brought something to my mind that happened in 1963. That was the year that I started my teaching career at Alex W. Spence Junior High in North Dallas. There were some guys there that I talked with. They went fishing caught several and they gave me one of the crappie they tied it behind the radiator in my room now that's a heater in case you young folks don't know what that is now after several days and I saw some ants coming in through the window I finally found that thing they thought it was funny. I didn't think it was very funny. I'd been putting up with that smell for quite some time. One of the guys who taught there was Glenn Stevens. He played center for East Texas years ago, back when Jerry Matthews was there. Matthews was playing football. And... Glenn was basketball, but somehow they became real buddies. And both, over time, became real good friends of mine, and as you might guess, all three of us were big cut-ups. I saw Glenn at Jerry's funeral. He's living in Tom, Oklahoma now. I've got to share something with you that he told me because that guy is still cutting up and still has me in stitches every time he gets a chance. He said this lady got up one morning, went to the bathroom while her husband was sitting in his recliner. And when she came into the living room, she was crying. And he asked her what was wrong. Why was she crying? And she said, I looked at myself in the mirror. She says, just look at me. She said, my hair's gray. A lot of it's gone. She said, just look at this double chin I've got. And she said, I'm way too fat. My dress just doesn't fit right. And she was pulling on it. And she says, and I got wrinkles everywhere. And she just stopped. And when she did, he got up out of his recliner. He put his arms around her and he says, but baby, you've still got 20-20 vision. <laughs> I thought I, you know, he, he is a nut, and I just love the guy to tell you the truth. Well, in the 17th century, Thomas Hobson rented out horses in Cambridge, England. He had a rule that any person who rented a horse must take the one that's standing nearest the stable door. No matter what station in life that customer might hold, and no matter how long he argued about it, Hobson stuck to his room. It didn't take long for Hobson's choice, which really was no choice at all, to become a familiar phrase. For Christians, ministry is a Hobson's choice. We don't really have a choice about whether we will be ministers. Our only choice 
is about what kind of ministers we're going to be. Can we create excitement? I like to create excitement. I like to have a good time. But I also know how to be serious. Kids I used to teach would tell you that. If you will, please, take your Bibles and turn to Revelations 3. Revelation 3. We're going to read verses 14 through 22 this morning. Please stand in honor of God's Word. And the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. Amen. To him who overcomes, I will grant to seat with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Father, I thank you this morning for each person present. I pray this morning as we discuss this portion of the Bible, I pray that we might learn from these scriptures as to how we as Christians might better ourselves and what we can do to strengthen your kingdom. I pray that everything I say and everything that I do this morning will bring glory to you and not to myself. These things I ask in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. The church at Laodicea in Asia Minor could just as easily be some church at the crossroads of America or in some county seat, just like Cooper. Or it could be in the countryside, like Charleston or Pacho. It could be on some busy thoroughfare, like I-30. Laodicea was well located. It was a wealthy commercial center. It was noted for both its medical influence and its industrial power. What the living Christ said to them, he's saying to us today, and what he desired of them, he desires of us. What he offered them, he offers us today. It is excitement in the church. Now first of all, I want us to take a look at a description of a paradox. Now what I'm referring to is saying one thing and meeting something else. Here is a living Christ, the very embodiment of the absolute truth and faithfulness. 
the fulfillment of the purpose of God, the Creator, the all-powerful God. Here also is a world of need. There was paganism, pessimism, and impurity everywhere you looked. It was a world at that time that was exploding in sin. Now in this setting is a church. It's composed of people whose relationship to Jesus Christ is personal and definite. People who claim eternal knowledge. And as a church, it is a redemptive fellowship that possesses unusual power. It is a community of healing in the midst of sick influences. It is a church of potentially dynamic witnesses. It is a people from whom Jesus is expecting positive power to flow to help a world that's in need. But instead, here is a church that's neither hot nor cold, just lukewarm. Now, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, let me put it like this. I went out to weed eat one day. I've got all my tools and everything with me. Linda says, you want a jug of water? I said, no. So I go and I start weed eating. Now, it's hot. It's over 100. I got thirsty. I remembered what she offered, but all I had in the pickup was a bottle of water that had been there no telling how long, and I drank it. It wasn't good. Cold water would have been much better. Even a cup of coffee would have been better. But there she hot and cold. I was right in the middle with that bottle of water from Walmart that was lukewarm. It was a situation that had lost its capacity to care for the world around it. It had lost its glow for the wonderful will of God and its feeling for people. It no longer has the conviction to act. Its excitement quotient was burning real low. What a paradox. Now listen to me. The same paradox applies to us today. We have the living Christ not only in the New Testament pages, but also of more than 20 centuries of history in seeing His power at work. All kinds of examples. The same living Christ speaks to us today. He's ready to pour fresh power into each one of our lives right now. And we live in an exploding world of people and pollution of lost. There's a lostness that exists. There's a lack of purpose. There is emptiness. There's loneliness. A searching, spiritually hungry world is out there. Perhaps our highest privilege is communicating the glad tidings of salvation through Christ to a needy world. If we live worthy of the glad tidings, then we can be effective in ministering to others. What will the churches do? Well, I'll tell you. Some are saying that the day of the church 
is just about over. There are others who say that when the church is gone, it'll never be missed. You know, I can't help but remember what Leo Miller told me. Out at Antioch, five miles out on 64 where this old man was raised and Leo was my intermediate Sunday school teacher years ago. But their crowd had dwindled down to just nearly nobody. <coughs> so the vote was cast and they closed the doors. Leo said later that a man came up to him and said, I can't believe y'all voted to close that church. And you know Leo. He opened the doors. Leo's fixing to close it. He said, you voted for it. He said, I didn't vote for it. He said, yeah, you did. Every time we opened those church doors, you never did show up. So you voted to close it. Amen. Listen to me. These are the most spiritually exciting days that we have ever known. Exciting things are happening all across America. Christian television programming is carried on every day, especially on Sundays. The gospel goes out through television into thousands of homes. And thousands more are exploring spiritual truths on the internet. My son works at the power plant over in Paris. One of his friends came up to me one day. He lives in Howe, Texas. And he said, Mr. Burns, I sure enjoy watching those things that come out of your church. We have internet service at our church is what I'm referring to and that man I pointed to right there is responsible for getting it started and I just had to say Amen. that it is going far and wide and people are learning many spiritual truths through internet. Countless believers are turning to Jesus for a more abundant life and they're experiencing and sharing the gospel daily with other people. God still has great things for his people. So what's necessary? What do we got to do? I'll tell you. We got to have some spiritual excitement in our souls to get things going right. Now second, these words to Laodicea express the plan of Christ for his church both then and now. Now believe me, Christ knows the church. Revelations 3.15 said that. I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. Christ commands the church too. Revelations 3.18 said that. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salves that you might see. We're always saying things like that. Well, I didn't know that. And we say, well, you open your eyes. Christ loves the church and he offers himself to it. In Revelations 3.20 he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, dine with him, and he with me. Now, I'm not talking about he's going to walk in here and sit down and start having pinto beans and cornbread and stuff with you. I'm talking about he'll come into your life and he'll change your ways and your life. That's what I mean. It is not Christ's will for any church to be lukewarm. Such is a condition of lifelessness, of apathy, and indifference. 
Lukewarm church is one that possesses no real excitement in its spiritual atmosphere. We were camped out over on the north side of Pat May's Lake one time and we went to church, Linda and I did, we went to a church and there was three of us on this side and two older women over there on that side and the minister. Ooh wee I cannot describe for you the gosh awful feeling that I had there and after I left. I have never been anywhere in my life in a religious situation such as this and felt so dead. Right, that's the word. <laughs> dead. It was absolutely that. Enthusiasm and excitement are intangible evidences of life stirring in a church. Laodicea evidently at one time had life. It was spiritually hot, it was involved, it was alive and serving, but something happened to it. Colossians 2, 1 and 2 gives Paul's references to this. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Lukewarmness is a condition nauseating to Christ. Putting it different, you may have done this. You make me sick. That's what we're talking about. What you're doing turns my stomach. He says, I'll spew you out. But you heard when I read my Bible, it says he would vomit it out. Same thing. And what is more, the church at Laodicea was sickeningly proud. Look here at me. It says it has no needs, yet Jesus knows that it's miserable, it's poor, it's blind, naked, and wretched. It is definitely not Christ's will for his church to be like that. It is Christ's will for the church to be alive and awake, alert, excited, and excitable. The Holy Spirit is the one who creates life in the church. He indwells believers in the church 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. He inhibits believers. Ephesians 2, 18 through 22 makes this plain. He makes the church be alive. Listen to what he says. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being filled, fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. There's power in the church. The power of the word of God and of the gospel of Christ can change lives. You're looking at one. 
Think about yourself. Doesn't matter about me. Think about yourself. Are you like you used to be when you were 18, 19, 20 years old, thought you knew every blame thing there was? Or have you changed? Romans 1, 16 says that it is the power of God unto salvation. Something happens when it's preached. There is love in the church. There is love in this church. God's love for us, our love responsive to Him, and our love for others. There's fellowship in the church, and there sure is fellowship in this church, as we all know. Now, fellowship is sharing, helping, ministering to others, not only in our church but outside our church. All of this is Christ's will and plan for His people. And this is exciting. Amen? Amen. That's right. The words of Christ point the pathway to excitement. Jesus says four simple things bring excitement to the church. First, confession of need. Revelations 3.18. He challenges the church to confess poverty, become rich, to confess nakedness and be clothed, to confess spiritual blindness and receive sight. Confession is essential to experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. Cleansing follows con confession. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not part of it. Not a fraction of it. All of it. Second, he says repentance. That's in Revelation 3.19. Repentance and zeal, they go together. Repentance is to recognize and acknowledge sin. Know it when you see it. And to have sorrow for it. I look back at some things I did and I wish to thunder I hadn't have done it. I know that some of the things I did destroyed my witness back in years past. But you can turn away from it when you recognize it and you get in it. You can get out of it and you can be somebody else. There's a man sitting in this church house right now. And I was in Inlow, Texas. I think at a funeral. And we stepped outside and this guy came up to me and he says, oh, I know him. We used to do this and we used to do that. Hey, get out of the past. Look at what you're dealing with right now. And I set him straight too. You know me. I let him know right quick that that man was not the man he used to know. And then I walked off. A change of mind happens. And when the mind changes, there's new actions and new directions that come about. The third thing, he says, is opening one's life to Christ. Jesus stands at the door of life awaiting our voluntary response. Billy Sunday is credited with the line that Jesus put the jam on the lower shelves of the pantry so that the little folk could reach it. This is another way of saying that Jesus talked to people in terms that they could understand. 
He put his message within the reach of all of us little folk. No one forces us, not even Christ. We must choose for ourselves. It is an individual act, one that each of us must express when Christ begins to control our lives. And this is an act of faith, truly trusting Him to do what He says He'll do. Christ gives the excitement. The book of Acts, if you want to really get into it, just read Acts. It gives you historical proof of this. And the fourth thing he says is obedience to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is obeyed and yielded to, life is exciting. We need to be filled with the Spirit according to God's command. In conclusion, know this. It is not the size of the church that counts. It is the Spirit that counts. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is excitement. And we know that right here at New Hope Church, right? Amen to that. Our song of invitation this morning it's page 596, I Surrender All. If any of you need to come forward this morning to make any kind of decision, you do so as we stand and sing. prayer this morning we're going to hold hands and we're going to dismiss by singing the family of God if you'll bow your heads please I'm going to ask this morning for Mr. Billy Ford to voice our prayer Amen. Let's join hands and sing.
friend for you. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. Thank you very much, Great. Matt. Appreciate it.
they're going to refer you back to your family physician. You have to go through them. Because unless you're really, really severely injured or it looks like you're injured from that broken back, you're not going to see that. So we'll see what the practitioner's back up. I said, what do I do here? I said, well, you know, that's the only way I do it. I said, well, you know, I'm going to do this. So then I just kept thinking about it. I was going to get my life 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 going to
so it, it opened it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's just right. Yeah. Did you get that out of there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to leave that in there. And then they pulled it back over and it took it. It never really, until <laughs> like this week, it never really started closing up. It started closing up. You got that stuff out there. Uh, that's probably a tendon that's damaged.